Alrighty, I think we are ready to go. So tonight I want to show you a little bit about a, a relatively new framework for Internet of Things, which is called Mongoose OS. It's been around for about a year. It's been under development for maybe two years or so. Uh, but it's really only taken off in the last um, six months, and in fact, it's, it's moving at a heck of a clip. So, the thing about IoT is a lot of the tools are really awful, and there's a lot of repeated stuff that you have to do over and over again. So, what I look for in, in the IoT space is a framework that takes most of the drudgery out of it for you and gets you up and running as fast as possible with too, not too much reinventing of the wheel. You want to have something which helps you be secure, allows you to manage your devices, upgrade them in the field, and hopefully can co cope with some of the, the network problems that you're likely to bump into. So this is a this is a, a platform that came um, from some guys from Google, um, and it, it it ticks most of those boxes. It it supports um, at, at least four different CPUs from different manufacturers. So if you run into problems like we did last week when Intel cancelled one of their IoT platforms, um, hopefully you can you can keep moving on other hardware. The tool chain is is quite good. Um, runs on Linux, Mac, Windows. Uh, the tool chain is completely open source. Um, there's a nice web IDE. Um, to get you up and running in a friendly way, but you can still use command line tools to interact with your devices while you're programming them. You can connect directly by USB, or you can you can even develop over the internet. Works well with with Amazon and Google, and I'll hopefully show you some interactions with Amazon tonight. And it allows you to upgrade your devices over the air, and that's really critical because the kinds of really awful security outcomes we've seen over the last six months, including the, the, uh, the new worm that did the rounds last week, um, really boils down to embedded systems which had no, no provision for updates. So people have bought um, systems like their, their train um, schedule boards that run Windows XP and nobody ever thought they'd need upgrading. And it's quite clear that it's no longer safe to sell a device that you can't upgrade. Um, Mongoose OS, again on, on, the, on the theme of doing some of the work for you, uh, provides you with, a, with, an, with an API framework where you can define service functions and call them over a serial port, over WebSockets, over a REST API, over MQTT, and it's the same code, the, the framework takes care of the transport layer. If you're familiar, familiar with the Arduino um, programming environment from, from embedded systems, you can use a lot of the same code as well. And the big thing for us is you can now program it in JavaScript. Yay! So a bit about uh, the Mongoose guys. Uh, the company is sysanta.com. They're based in Dublin. Uh, four Russian guys in Dublin who work from Google. That's not unusual. Um, they started basically shipping a web server for embedded devices, and they've generalised that into a into a whole operating system. It's it's GPL'd. If you if you don't want to open your source, you can negotiate with them for a commercial license. Um, and it works with the, the ESP series of chips from Espressif in China, works with TI chips, works with ST microchips, so you've got a, a hardware to suit everyone's tastes there. Now, I, I like these things. Um, they're about available for between five and 10 bucks each, which means anyone who's interested in IoT can get started. Um, if you want to, for as little as one one light, one button, up to all sorts of interesting things. Um, and a lot of the hardware for these is also open source, so you don't have to fight to get documentation or understand how they work. You can download the schematics and even build your own if you want to. And, and these, these kinds of devices have been a real boon for open source people. Um, you can code them in C, in Lua, in Python, and JavaScript. So. Micro JavaScript is a JavaScript engine written in C that you can embed into your C programs, including into Mongoose OS. And it is a strict subset of ES6, which means if you have a valid micro JavaScript program, it's a valid ES6 program. The reverse is not quite true. The whole thing is about 25k of code, 1k of RAM. Got no standard library. 
like maybe a dozen function calls to do basic stuff. But they've got this foreign function call interface, which means that if there's anything you need from the C runtime, you can basically embed, it, embed the function signature of the C function that you want to call, and you call it. So it's, um, it's familiar code, but it's in a very restrictive environment. So the tool chain itself, which I, I mentioned before, is really nice. Uh, the whole thing is written in Go. Not surprising that it, it came from Google. Uh, there's a really simple install process. If you want to go through compiling it yourself, that's that's pretty good too. And once you once you have the the tools installed, the process of taking a device out of the box and bringing it into the into the ecosystem is, is really quite pleasant. And I'll show you that in a minute, hopefully. So you you get command line tools which let you list your file system on the device, copy files in, copy files out make configuration calls, or you get this nice little IDE which will do the whole thing. So this is this is the, the wizard mode in, in the IDE for setting up a new device. Um, and once you've done that, you can look at your files, you can manage your projects, you can browse through the device configuration, you can inspect the, the RPC API. And as I said, you can, you can talk to them over USB or you can talk to them over Wi-Fi. Now, if you've got a Mac, you may find that USB is iffy, not just because they keep changing the shape of the plugs, but also manufacturers seem to have this habit of making up their own USB device IDs. So uh, the, the Mac OS USB drivers, although they theoretically support all this hardware, they don't actually recognize it. So this is why I've got a Linux box in the middle, and it also serves as a, as a fuse. If the smoke coils out of the circuitry, hopefully it doesn't get as far as my Mac. And I have had an experience where my then three-year-old daughter decided to move some wires to see what would happen when the smoke started pouring out. Um, continuing the pattern of, of ease of use, it's, it's literally four lines of code to get hooked up to AWS IoT. So that's the ecosystem that Amazon Web Services gives you for Internet of Things devices, which gives you a, a catalogue of all your devices, the ability to inspect their configuration, and, and the ability to react to their actions. So with that AWS IoT console, you can look at those devices, and more importantly, you can set up rules to react to their, their changes of state. So I might just go back and, and briefly explain some of those terms. Firstly, if you haven't heard about it, MQTT is a very simple message bus protocol intended for embedded systems. And essentially, you're sending a, a topic string, which looks quite a bit like a file name, and a chunk of text. Now, in, in, in the case of, a, of an Internet of Things, we tend to use JSON for that text, um, continuing the JavaScript thing. Now, Amazon's IoT framework is theoretically compatible with any other MQTT client, but they've done a couple of weird things uh, for good reasons which make it a little unfamiliar to, to vanilla MQTT clients. You have, they've, they've cut out all the, all the reliable delivery stuff, which makes it faster, but also not reliable, and they've deleted the functionality for what's called a retained publish, which is where you publish something to the message service and it stays there even if you then disconnect. So what they give you instead is this thing called a device shadow. And that's simply a JSON document which is a bunch of configuration. So it's basically a configuration file in the cloud for your device. And it's intended that if you want to interact with the device, that you interact with the shadow document and then the system takes care of synchronizing that down to the device. So if it's offline, um, it'll, the message will finally get through when the device comes back online. And if it happens to be online, then it's, it's relatively transparent. In fact, all those shadow document changes actually happen over the message bus protocol. So it's, it's, it's kind of a, a convenience wrapper around the MQTT protocol. So, the, the second part of, of the IoT ecosystem that's, that's really important is the rules engine. And that's how you hook it into the rest of the Amazon ecosystem. So if you, 
you don't care about loss of signal, if, if real-time processing is all you're worried about, then MQTT solves all those problems. The shadow document helps you deal with disconnects. Unfortunately, all the reaction features in Amazon work off of those MQTT publishers, not off of state changes. So if you want to react to something happening, like I push a button, you can't subscribe to tell me when the shadow document that represents that button changes. You have to have the device publish a message to which you then react. So that's a little bit weird. But the basics of a rule is when a message comes in matching some pattern for a topic, which is very much like a file wildcard, and it's got some payload, you may, you may care about it, you may not, so you don't have to match on the payload, then you do some action. And the actions can be put it in some database, send some notification <coughs> to some other system. So that, in a simple case, think of something like burglar alarm. Motion sensor goes, send me a text message. So you can do all that with no code through the, the AWS ecosystem. You can put, up, put the, the information out onto other message bus systems, and the real kicker is Lambda functions, serverless computing. So you can set a rule to say, whenever the device sends whatever kind of message I care about, pass that to a particular Lambda function, and that's where things get cool. But just before I give you a demo of that, I wanna talk about one more feature of the ecosystem, which is the over-the-air updates and, and the packaging system. So the chunk of firmware that you put onto your, your device is, <coughs> Basically a zip file containing some JavaScript files and, and a bit of configuration. Um, and the cool thing is, is you can upload that zip file to the net somewhere and then send a message to the device saying, go and get this URL and verify its signature and then install it. So it's really very simple to upgrade these devices in the field and you can, you can even do rollbacks and, and version checks uh, if you want to. Um, the other thing, um, this project is under very active development and I've, I've literally updated my source code check out three or four times this weekend in the, in the course of um, refining this presentation. And they just added a, a library management and project management feature so you can now download a bunch of example libraries, example projects, uh, create your own projects and publish those and, and share them around. So it's, it's, um, it's becoming quite dynamic. So, now I want to show you, hopefully, how to do all this. So, let's see if this is going to work. Here is Fresh from China. Brand new, still in the bag. Okay, so we have our Linux box. Yes, this is really... What's their failure rate out of 10 units? Money back guarantee? Alrighty, let's see. So, over here on our Linux box, we have MongoSource UI. I'm running the web server which presents the IDE. And somewhere over here. have a new device. I choose what serial port it's on. Go tell me what's there. It's just there isn't one. Come on, demo demands. Okay, and that's an ESP32, and I want to install the operating system on it. And down the bottom here we see it's downloading that off the net via my phone. Fetching mongoosos.com downloads ESP32.zip. Alrighty, and now we are writing the fly. 
Rush. Okay, so here's what I prepared earlier. So this little project is something that came out of an interaction with, with one of my friends on Twitter who said, I wish there was some way I could remember whether or not I took my medication today. I always get to, just about to walk out the front door and think, did I take it or not? I thought, well, every good problem needs an IIT solution. So <laughs> this is a box that remembers when it was last opened. So inside the box we have a magnetic sensor that detects whether the lid, lid is open and closed, and one of these little USB 32s. And it knows how often it should be opened, and when it was last opened. And the way it does that is. Over here on AWS, we have a rep representation of this device, which has a shadow document which contains some information about what's happened. So we know the phone number that we're supposed to alert when it doesn't get opened. We know the last time it was opened. And right now, I just opened it, so it was opened relatively recently. But if I could perhaps get someone to hold the microphone for 30 seconds, sure. then we can juggle some numbers here. So I think it was last opened then. So we subtract about 23 hours. Can anybody subtract 23 hours from a number in seconds in their head? A lot of people with laptops open, so <laughs> shout a formula. Simulate me having eighty-two thousand eight hundred seconds. That helps. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what I've done is I've tweaked the shadow document to tell the device it wasn't last opened twenty-three hours ago. And that light should have turned to color. Okay. All right, it is not my lucky night. Okay, so let's go through. <laughs> let's go through what should happen. So we have a, a little configuration document which tells us the state of our device. Changes to that propagate down to the device sometimes, and those changes result in messages being published. So we go over to our device.
listen to all the things that Tobias is saying. So that's essentially a wildcard subscription for any messages starting with our device name and So when the device figures out that it has, it needs to send an alert, it publishes a message saying, you forgot to take your medication. And I didn't. Okay. All right. Imagine if we had an internet that <laughs> there is a list of rules. And the rule is when you see name of device slash event slash reminder, you invoke this lambda function. And what the lambda function does is uses the Amazon SNS, the simple notification service, to send either an email or an SMS as you desire. And then record in the shadow document that it has done so, so that it doesn't keep sending one every every call interval, it just, okay, you got reminded, and then there's a second threshold where if it gets to the point where you're overdue, ooh, we're back. So in this case, we have a message that looks like this, um, reminder event, for some reason they make it, they make the, you have this form where you say, I'm interested in this topic, and I want this field, and I want to have this expression on the field, and then it turns that into a piece of pseudo SQL, which it then shows you every other time you want to see what that rule is. Um, possibly on the presumption that SQL is friendly and familiar to the kind of people who, who work with IoT, which is I think completely wrong, but that's just an aside. So we have a invoke some lambda rule. In this case, I have a function over here, and. So a tip for anyone who wants to work with this, there's a, some really good um, tutorials on, on Mongoose's website, but basically the thing you have to do is create a Lambda function first. So whenever you create a Lambda function, it asks you to define a trigger, and whenever you create a rule, which can be a trigger for a Lambda function, it asks you to create a Lambda function to run from it. And then it leads you into this endless loop where it wants you to keep just doesn't make sense. So create a lambda function, ignore everything about triggers and just skip over that page. Take one of the template examples that's closest to what you want, get your function there, use the web console to test the lambda function to make sure it does what you want. And then once you've got that happening, go back to IoT, create a rule and have the rule invoke that lambda function. And that will be a lot less confusing than the way some of the Tutorials what you do. Some of the other tips is is really easy in embedded systems to get into an unrecoverable crash loop where you have to wipe your memory and, and go back to, to ground zero. So put a, a five or a 10 second timer in your boot code, uh, which just does nothing, but it gives you the opportunity to go and delete, delete the, the broken file off of your flash file system before it crashes. Uh, otherwise, you may end up in a situation where it, it's, it's crashing so fast you can't rescue it. Um, and the other useful thing I'd say is everything should have a flashing light in it. If for no other reason, you can make it do something when it gets to the end of its setup successfully, and then you know it got through that without crashing. Because one of the problems with, um, with micro JavaScript is 25k doesn't leave a whole lot of space for error handling. So it'll typically just stop running your code when it gets to a, a syntax error, which is uh, probably less friendly than people are, are used to. So, um, let's skip over that one. Um, basically what we have with, with, with Mongoose OS is 
a framework which which claims to get you up and running with Internet of Things 90% faster. And I think that's 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 probably true. It's it's evolving really quickly. Um, the JavaScript is I think not the language of choice for the developers. They tend to write the features in C first and then back put them to the JavaScript runtime when somebody complains about them being missing. Um, but for a JavaScript person who wants to get involved with, with Amazon Lambda, it's um, a really inexpensive way to, to get up and running and doing some interesting stuff. I was hoping to bring you my, my second demo tonight, which would be a, a remote control car controlled by Twitter messages. But, uh, <laughs> ran into some API problems there as well. So that's uh, probably enough from me for the, tonight. Uh, if you have any questions, I could maybe take a few quickly. Can we see the editor that Wondrous OS provides <coughs> with micro JavaScript? Yes. Just so you get a sense of the extent of micro JavaScript. Yes, you can. <coughs> okay, so file browser, fairly ordinary looking JavaScript. Callbacks or promises? Yeah, no promises. <laughs> 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 Callbacks, yes, promises, no. Um, no, I think. <laughs> no. <laughs> Callbacks are async. I've actually got two CPUs in that. Yes, yes, so you get getting pretty funky with it. Mm -hmm. um, you've got a nice graphical configuration editor. So to enroll a device in Amazon AWS, which basically plug, plugs it up to the endpoint for the MQTT and download some certificates, it's pretty much click one button, choose your region, choose a policy, and away you go. And if you want to get into details, all the configuration does is there for you to play with. Um, and you've got a nice browser for the, for the APIs. So, you know, potentially you can plonk one of these things down with, with basically no code on it and drive it from a piece of Python code over a REST API. Yes? Um, so you said one of the options was USB to and the other one was Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. Does that OS, when it's flashing, does it have some sort of bootstrap thing that allows you to put in a username bus? Yes, you either you either use the command line tool, um, you go MOS Wi-Fi network name password, or you go back to that little um, setup wizard here. So you're flashing it USB first, and then after that it's Wi-Fi. Is that how? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, no. You, it also <coughs> if it's not configured for Wi-Fi, it'll run up an access point, and then you can get onto a little simple web server and type your credentials in. That unfortunately is kind of the state of the art in, in Wi-Fi setup. Nobody has come up, apart from WPS, which is the sort of push a button and hope for the best thing, <laughs> has come up with any good way to get a, a new device onto a, onto a secure Wi-Fi network. And I think so it's you, one of the big unsolved problems in IoT. So you have to do it that way? Like you, you flash it, you turn it on, then you connect to it? Or is it, you can do it the other way as well? You can, you can. Um, Flashing it is here in, in the wizard. It's it's pulling down the default firmware from Mongoose's web service. But if you've written, already written your own firmware, which may include um, your, your, your credentials, firmware. then you simply flash your firmware on, MOS flash, you know, Bob dot zip, and you're up and running. <coughs> but otherwise, yeah, you can use the cable there and follow that exact wizard. So you can just you flash one of those pre-built ones in, write the configure Wi-Fi on, and save it to the configuration on your device. Yeah. So that's I think it's um, it's pretty good to be honest. From in, a lot in, of the different in terms of in terms of being able to <coughs> being able to do testing and and development deployment from a make file, um, being able to field deploy these devices and commission them basically no touch. It's it's really handy compared to. A lot of a lot of legacy systems where it's you know, 
there's some guy with a solar who might be in a trench in the pouring rain for three days trying to commission something. Up the back, yes. Speaking specifically about the Espressif chips, there's, there's quite a comprehensive SDK from the manufacturer which lets you do various things in C. And then you've got the, the, um, the Arduino compatibility layer, so there's a huge amount of open source um, code in that space. And then um, in terms of, if I just close this down, look over here. Um, as I said, the library mechanism literally dropped into, into GitHub I think Thursday, so you know, you've got 20 or so different libraries there now. Um, I expect to see that blossoming uh, quite significantly in the near future. Yep. So this idea is a chunk of Go code running on your laptop typically, in my case it's running on this little Linux box here, and all those files are in my home directory. So I, in fact, typically edit them in Emacs and then um, upload them to the device. So yeah. Um, mentioned that it supports over the air updates. Yes. Is that just for the code you've written or is that the underlying OS as well? It's potentially one or the other or both. Alrighty, thank you.